Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, we are looking at the damage caused by the recent ice storm that ravaged the trees in much of Oklahoma. Urban foresters with the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry have tips on assessing the damage and making a plan to clean up your landscape trees. Becky Carroll, OSU Associate Extension Specialist for Fruit and Pecans, joins us in the Pecan Orchard at the OSU Cimarron Valley Research Station to talk about cleanup and harvesting of damaged pecan trees. Back in the garden, host Casey Hinches creates a decorative concrete planter, and we have another interesting plant relationship. As Oklahomans, we are familiar with the occasional ice storm that we get here. Unfortunately, this one caught us all off guard because it was so early in the season. It also caught our trees off guard because so many of them, even if they were deciduous, still had their leaves on them. This added to the surface area in which they were able to collect that freezing rain and ice, which added to the weight to their limbs. That's why we're seeing so much devastation right now across the central part of our state. Joining us today is Riley Coy and Mark Bays with Oklahoma Forestry Services to talk to us about how to assess the damage to our home landscape trees. Also, Becky Carroll, an extension specialist, is joining us to talk to us about the damage that was suffered on Oklahoma pecan trees. Hi, my name is Riley Coy. I'm with Oklahoma Forestry Services. Uh, you may notice that we've been ravaged by an ice storm that hit much of central Oklahoma and western Oklahoma in the last week or so. Looking around, how can any of these trees possibly be saved, you might be wondering. Well, we're going to show you a little bit today about what to look for in your trees, uh, what, how to assess your trees, and whether or not they can be saved. So two things we want to talk to you about today. Safety, first and foremost. You're going to be working around a lot of unstable limbs. You're going to be using sharp equipment. We want you to be safe, especially if you don't use this equipment often and you're out there in a pinch trying to get some of this work done. Safety first is number one priority. Secondly is patience. This is not just going to be a couple month cleanup ordeal. This is going to be a long drawn out process. And we want you to realize that having patience is okay. Trees live a long time. They're on a much longer time scale than what we are they can deal with this stress. So it's not important that you have to go out there and fix all of this damage right now. Have a little patience, prioritize, get your most important hazards out of the way first, the things over your roof, the things over your driveway, the loose limbs that have potential to do some damage to yourself, your family, or your property. That's what we want you to focus on. Now, inevitably in a situation like this, we're going to have an army of people with chainsaws knocking on doors. We want you to be cautious. While they may be good to help you clean up your yard, pick up the deadfall, clear out the driveway, we really stress the importance of having an ISA certified arborist look at your trees and check them for structural integrity, check them to see if they may potentially survive this or may have to be removed. Uh, they're specially trained in looking at tree damage such as this. So we have a link on our website treesaregood.org that can find you a certified arborist wherever you're at within the state. So while you're out there doing this cleanup, there are a couple things to consider. Wood utilization is a big one. All this debris laying on the ground is going to go to the landfill. There are some things that you could do to potentially utilize that wood. Uh, get together with your neighbors to get a contractor and maybe get a lower rate. You can utilize uh, the limbs and debris as mulch. If you do lose a large tree, there are sawmills around that will happily saw that up for you. 
turn it into slabs, allow you to make something out of that old oak tree in your front yard that you've been so attached to your whole life. Uh, if you go on our website, there's a link called Sawmill Map that shows you all the sawmills in the area. That's a great resource to use if you are having to lose your trees. One of the biggest decisions you may face is whether or not to keep your tree. And Oklahoma Forestry Services has some guidelines for you to follow to help you make those decisions. So we're out here today to kind of take a look at trees that have varying degrees of damage to them. Let's take a first look at one of the trees that didn't really sustain too much damage. So we have a sawtooth oak right here. If you look up into the crown, you can see that several of the branches are broken off on it. And it's only a small percentage. I would estimate this to be about 25% of the crown gone. So this tree has a really good chance of surviving. If you look up top where some of those branches are broke, one of the first things that you should be considering doing is that needs to be cut back to the next union because if you just have a real jagged broken branch on there, what you're gonna see is a lot more decay will move into the tree. But overall, this one is in pretty good shape. Even though you see a lot of degree, debris down on the bottom, this is a candidate for keeping around. So if your tree looks like this oak tree, there's about 75% of it that has been damaged. If you take a close look up the main trunk of the tree, what you'll see is none of the heartwood has been exposed. So the branches that have broken off of this tree can be correctively pruned back on the main trunk. And up at the top of the tree, it still has its same leader. So these are one of those candidates that although 75% of it is gone, this is one that we really should take a look at, do some mitigated pruning on it and then monitor it for the next year because once you remove those hazards it's not going to be an elevated threat until sometime down. One of the things that we noticed this go around because it was such a historic uh, event is that some of the trees that we normally uh, would associate with being ice tolerant like bald cypress even sustain damage. Maybe it was just happening so early in the year, but bald cypress is one that we usually see do well. But even so, that's not the case with this one. So this is an older established bald cypress, and it's lost about 50% of the, of the branches on one side of it. And so this is one of those, the top is intact. I think with some corrective pruning along those branches that were lost, this one is certainly something that we should give it another chance just to see how well it could possibly recover. What's unfortunate is that we're seeing a lot of what's behind me right here. When you have that tree that is over 75%, and in this instance, this tree is obviously one of those that we should consider removing. Because if you look up into it, all the, all the damage is going into the heartwood of the tree. So it's unfortunate, but this is one of those that we probably should go ahead and schedule to have removed. <clears throat> now we've given you a whole lot of advice here today know that there's still a lot of different places that you can go. Go to Oklahoma Forestry Services webpage, www.forestry.ok.gov, and then certainly look for resources from Oklahoma State University. They have a number of wonderful fact sheets that they have that can help, help us get through this. And again, lastly, please be safe and please be patient. Our trees have been recovering from these kind of tragic events for a lot longer than we've been helping them. So reach out to us, reach out to those in the know, and hopefully we can all get through this together. Today we're at the Cimarron Valley Research Station just north of Perkins and we're assessing some of the uh, damage we received to our pecan orchard here at the station. And so we had that historic ice 
uh, event occur on Monday and Tuesday of this past week. And it, um, it caused a lot of damage to our large uh, pecan trees that we have in our research plots. One part of, of the uh, historic part of that ice storm was how early it was. Our, our trees were fully leafed out, had just a, a full canopy of foliage, and many of our trees hadn't been harvested. And you can see on, on some of these limbs that are hanging still on the tree, they're covered uh, with a crop of, these are Kansas pecans. And you can see the shucks, they are, um, they're, they're opened. These nuts have been ripe for a while, but they were still hanging in the tree. Um, and we decided to harvest some of the others that were falling out of the tree a little bit earlier. But the Kansa, they are a early ripening pecan, but you can see once these sutures split, that nut is ripe. And you can see the shuck is still green and it's not been frozen. Uh, we only got to about 29 degrees here at the research station. And normally we think of having damage to the shucks and leaves at 28 or a little bit lower. So we really didn't get damage to the, to the green tissue, but we got damage from the weight of the ice. And having the weight of the leaf, leaf load and the crop load, we lost a lot of our major limbs. And so today we're kind of just trying to clean up the orchard, getting some of the limbs out of the way so we can finish harvesting these trees. It's going to be difficult to shake a tree when you have all these limbs hanging. So we're going to try to remove those, get in here where we can harvest the, the rest of the crop. I'm not exactly sure how we're going to remove the crop from these limbs that are detached. But as long as we, um, maybe if we let these shucks dry down a little bit more, the nuts will fall out a little bit easier and we'll be able to run the harvester over the orchard floor. But first step is just getting clean up and not getting too excited about worrying about all the major cuts that we need to do. After we get them harvested, we can come back and do some of those, those pruning cuts that need to be done to remove those splits and some of the limb removal that uh, is gonna help with the, with the restoration of the orchard. But many of our trees, they lost the top branches, so we're gonna have to have a lift in here with some pole saws to do that, um, that final pruning. And it may take several months or, or even into next year trying to get these cleaned up and where they're producing uh, like we need to again. When we lose those, those major branches at the top, pecans are pretty resilient. They're gonna push out new shoots and a lot of those new shoots will uh, be very whippy and grow really quickly because it's trying to restore that canopy. So we ask that people, whenever we're, we're thinking about fertilizing this next spring, maybe they don't fertilize right when they start uh, new regrowth, but maybe wait and see how the trees are responding. If they're, they're growing slowly, may add a little bit of fertilizer, but we don't want them to grow too quickly. So that's a big point in, in getting our trees back into shape is growing enough, but not too quickly so that the the uh, top may be too weak to hold leaves or, or new fruit. So it'll take many years to get back to where we were at the research station, but pecan trees, they, they like to grow. So even if you're um, cutting them back severely, they're gonna push new growth. Um, it may be a good time if you have a variety that you don't like, it may be a good time to go in and do some, some uh, grafting this next spring. So this is the first time that we've had an ice storm at the research station. Normally you think of them in the eastern part of the state. And so a lot of our homeowners around here are seeing the same type of damage. And what we recommend is take care of those, those uh, limbs that are dangerous, have someone come in and remove those for you, but be patient and just wait a little bit before you uh, come in and try to solve all of your problems with your trees. Um, it's not going to hurt to to leave them and do some of that final pruning later. So it might be a good time to think about hiring an arborist to come in and take a look at your trees and how healthy they are and if, if trying to save them is a, the proper uh, way to go about that. So um, be patient and, uh, and watch them. Uh, it'll be a 
a, a time to watch and see how they regrow and, and learn a little bit about how those trees uh, respond to major pruning at this time. If you're like me, you probably have a few random towels around that probably aren't in the best condition to continue using in the bathroom, but they're also something that you don't necessarily want to throw away because you might need them. You never know when you're going to need them. Well, today we have a project that utilizes some of those old torn ragged towels in order to make a beautiful plant container. So for this project, you're gonna need a few materials that are likely laying around your house. Um, you're going to need a bag of quick setting concrete or cement. You're also going to need a few buckets, one for mixing and then one for a mold. Um, you could also use another plastic plant container or something to serve as this mold as well. You're also gonna need some plastic bags, like trash bags of some sort. Any disposable towels, those are important. You'll need those as well. And remember, these towels are not ever gonna be used again, so they are permanently part of the container. Furthermore, you're gonna need something to mix the cement with. You'll also need gloves because you don't wanna to actually touch the cement with your bare skin. It can be very uh, detrimental to your skin, very drying. Um, and then you'll also need water as well in order to mix this up. When you are mixing the cement, keep in mind you're gonna want it a little bit sloppier and soupier than what you would normally mix this cement. So the first step that you're gonna do is take your mold and set it upside down. Then you're gonna to wanna to take one of your towels that you're using and lay that over the mold to kind of start playing with the size of the towel and also how you want it to look draping over that mold. It might be that you want the towel corners to lay out on the ground a little bit. Um, it might be that you want them to drape completely down, which when you reverse it means that they'll be draped completely upward. We found that a square shape actually works better um, just because proportionally it hangs over the base a little bit better. So you might wanna go ahead and trim off the edges. Also, if you look at it, sometimes towels have a little bit more embroidery or decoration on one end or the other. So you might wanna cut that off if you don't want it to be seen in the final product. Once you're satisfied with how the shape of it looks hanging over the mold, at this point, it's time to mix up your quick crete. Um, you're gonna to wanna to mix that up again, like I said, a little bit soupier than what you normally would. Once you've got that mixed up, we're gonna now place the towel into the quick crete and stir it in. This is your chance to really saturate that towel. Also, just to really kind of start that process, it's good to go ahead and water your towel, wet your towel, before you throw it into the quickcrete so that it's not absorbing all of that moisture out of the mixed quickcrete. So soak the towel, put that in the quickcrete, um, and really stir it. You're gonna wanna coat every part of that towel, both sides of it. You don't wanna see the original color of the towel or anything. Um, the more you coat it, the stronger the container is going to be um, as a final product. Before you drape your cement coated towel over your mold, you want to first place a plastic bag over the mold so that it makes it easy to remove it later on. Once you've got that plastic bag over the mold, go ahead then and drape your cement towel over that mold. And now it's an important time to go ahead and start playing with the way it's hanging and draping down that container because as it dries, the way it dries is going to be what it looks like when you turn it upside down, or right side up, I should say. Once you're satisfied with the way the towel is draped and you're happy with the angles of it all, at this point, you wanna set it aside and allow that cement to cure for at least 24 hours, but really check the directions on the cement that you purchased. You can see we've allowed ours to cure as they've solidified a little bit here. Um, and now at this point, what we're gonna look at doing is drilling holes in them. This is something that you can do if you plan to fill it with soil or use it as a container that you wanna make sure does drain. 
But like containers that you would buy, not all of them have holes. So if you wanted to keep it as a solid container, um, just be aware that it's going to hold some of that moisture for you. We're gonna use a drill with a mason bit here. Um, and of course we wanna make sure we've got our safety glasses on. And we're gonna go ahead and drill a few drain holes in here. So if you wanted to drill holes and you've got that done, now it's just time for the big reveal. So gently um, make sure that you can kind of pull that up. The other thing we've noticed though is sometimes this drapes and it kind of drapes in a little bit um, around that bucket. So you might have to just gently kind of tease it out a little bit, but it should lift off pretty easily. And then and flip it over like that. And now we've got our container. So of course, like a, any plant, you're gonna wanna turn it and face it the way you like it the best. And on this one, we used a pot that was round. So you can see we used just a round pot to give us more of a rounded base to it we had that flipped over. The one thing is, is you might have to stack several buckets on top just to give you that height so the towel can drape uh, freely as it cures. Now the two differences we used here, you can see this one was a, a typical bath towel, so it was a little bit thicker and it actually has done better as far as drying and curing. It's pretty solid. This one was more of a dish towel we wanted to try just because it had some texture to it. Um, but you can see the smaller towel, it's a little bit flimsier. So I don't know that I would recommend using a dish towel. I would probably stick with one of the old bath towels that you might have. So on this one, for our particular situation, at this point you could put potting soil in here and plant it with some nice plants if you wanted to and set it by your front porch. Um, but we've got something here that we're just gonna set inside of it. So we've just got a, a fern. We're gonna place that in there. And that helps finish your display. Now this particular one, we've just left natural, the natural cement color, which I think is nice because you get a lot of color from the plants that you add. But if you're like many gardeners that have a particular color scheme, you of course could spray paint this pot to match those. Organisms do not live in isolation from each other. We're always interacting. So whether it's human and plant or human and animal, animal and animal, plant and plant, there's always interactions. And sometimes those interactions actually play a role in the lives of the organisms. Sometimes the interactions are positive for both species, sometimes they're negative for both species, and sometimes one gets something out of the uh, relationship and one doesn't. So the first one we're going to talk about is mutualism. In mutualism, both species benefit from a relationship. So in the case of pollinators and flowers, the pollinators get nectar out of the deal and the uh, flowers get pollinated. After flowers get pollinated, they, they get fertilized and so then the seeds can develop and reproduce, allow the flower to reproduce with seeds. So that's one example of mutualism. Another example of mutualism is plants that actually depend on each other to survive. In this case, it's actually obligatory mutualism because these are lichens. They're composed of a fungus and an algae, and they cannot live apart. When they are in a lichen situation, they are actually depending on each other to survive. So there's different kinds of lichens, as you can see. There's orange ones, and there's crusty ones, and gray ones and all kinds of colors. You'll see these on headstones, you'll see these on fence posts, you'll see these on living trees. And what they're doing is the lichen and the, the fungus and the um, algae are helping each other to survive. So fungus cannot photosynthesize, so they can't make their own food. They have to digest things outside their body 
and then absorb the nutrients. But algae can make its own food because it photosynthesizes. But algae needs a wetter place to live. And so the fungus can absorb water and they can absorb nutrients and then they can give that to the, to the algae and the algae photosynthesizes and gives its sugars to the fungus. So they work together to have a little place to live. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, we're looking at plants used for a different type of sowing. Casey will have the blues of the indigo plant, we'll bowl you over with cotton, and an OSU professor of textile science will join us to explore the world of dyes. Along with the textiles, we'll also look at overseeded Bermuda grass for winter interest. We wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.